All right, welcome everybody. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, so I'm not going to bore you with details on me and um, housekeeping. You kind of all know the deal. Highly encourage video. Um, we're gonna, as we just asked, like where everybody's sitting. Um, then, you know, we're gonna be using the chat during this. There's not a huge amount of people, so it looks like we'll be able to get some really good questions in. Um, really excited for today's presentation. So we have Julie, Jackie, and Tom from our talent acquisition team. They are some of our best recruiters, super engaging. Um, you'll be able to get a lot out of them. And this is just an opportunity for you as students and people early in your career. What are your burning questions for recruiters? What do you want to know? What do you, what kind of tips, tricks, what are the secrets? Um, you want any of your, anything debunked? Um, now's the time to ask. So with that, I will turn it over to our presenter so they can introduce ourselves and then we can get the question started. All right. Who wants to start introducing themselves? <laughs> Julie, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, Julie, I think go ahead. I'm gonna pop my screen up here. Okay. Um so hi, everybody. If you were on the call last week, I was also on that call. Uh, we had a lot of people, so hopefully I didn't scare everybody away last week and they didn't want to come back this week. Um, but I am a staffing consultant. Um, I handle hiring for uh, human resources, for legal, and for all IT jobs domestically across Corning. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to everybody today. So I look forward to hearing everybody's questions and what your backgrounds are um, and how we can help you. Um, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, excited that you guys are uh, on the call and uh, hopefully we can give you guys some insight. I handle the executive recruiting full Corning. Um, so, uh, you know, excited to hopefully give you guys some insight into, um, you know, what maybe best practices, but uh, I've read through some of the questions that went through. So uh, looking forward to uh, interacting. And uh, my name is Jackie. I am a staffing consultant here for Corning, um, focusing within our optical communications uh, overall division, specifically for the fiber and cable group. Um, so a lot of uh, technical engineering uh, yeah, awesome things that we see, um, and definitely um, excited to be a part of the uh, presentation again. I've had a chance to participate in a few other groups, speak with a few of you. Um, and there were lots of good questions on some of the past presentations. So definitely looking to, uh, to kind of see what other questions you guys have for us and hopefully we can give you some, uh, some good advice and insight. Right. Thanks. So we did have some questions in advance and I will, so I'll start with those until we start getting some questions in the chat. So everybody feel free to submit your questions as you think of them. Um, so one of the first questions is how do, how do you project the irrelevant experience like an on-campus job on the resume? And then how do you speak about that? Take that one and just let me make sure I understood. So it was like on campus, um, like if they had a job while in school that was like a campus related job. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, like it. probably if they're like an engineering major, but they had a cashier job at the food court or something like that. Yeah. Um, so. so I always think that, you know, somebody that is going to school full time and working, I mean, you're balancing a, a really full plate. And I think that that is demonstrating some really good um, skills that are gonna be transferable. So even if you're an engineering major and you know, you have a job that maybe isn't related to engineering, the fact that you were able to balance both of those things and do them very well. Um, again, there's some core skills there that I think you can highlight and think about when you're talking about your strengths in an interview. Uh, as far as listing it on your resume, um, if it's not super relevant to the job or your major, maybe just make it um, not as um, like top of the list on your resume. And, and I'll let my team weigh in here as well. I think it's worth 
listing somewhere in, in chronological order on your resume in terms of experience. If you have internships and those are more relevant, put them towards the top, maybe um, put some more information about those. But I, I definitely think, you know, you spent that time and, and you put in those, those long hours to work while you were in school. And I think that that's um, something that should be celebrated on your resume and, and certainly talked about. Yeah, I agree with Jackie. Um, I see this a lot and, and it's actually, so when you're in school, I mean, going to school is a full-time plus job, right? Um, so if you're able to work on top of that, I think that really shows a lot of initiative to hiring managers. And if you can't, that's okay too. But if you do, you definitely want to highlight that. So I usually recommend having a, a relevant work experience where, you know, Jackie said to talk about your internships and that's where you want to have your your internship you know your title and then you want to have some bullet points describing what you did and then maybe below that you want to have a section that just says you know work experience and that's where you could put you know um worked at Wegmans as a cashier or you know worked at the bookstore as a cashier or whatever the case might be and you probably don't need a lot of bullet points unless you feel like you did anything relevant there that's more of just to say hey i did this while i was in school um i also think it's important to add to your resume you know, if you played a sport and you were a coach or, or, or in a leadership position in that, you know, that's also great experience that you can add that's going to be applicable to show that, hey, I have the ability to influence, I have the ability to lead, which is going to be critical for a lot of professional jobs. And that goes not only for athletics, that goes for clubs that you're a part of, if you're taking a leadership position in those clubs, you know, and that's something that you could easily um, label, you know, extracurricular activities, leadership experience, where you could specifically pull out, you know, that you were the treasurer for, I don't know, a finance group or whatever. I, I don't, I've been out of college so long, I can't even remember what group. <laughs> um, but I'm sure there's lots of exciting things that you're all participating in. And you want to pull out those experiences. And, and if you're still in school, you know, you want to take those times to join into those groups to gain that leadership ex experience, because it may seem not important, um, but it is because it's, it's giving you the ability to, to interact with folks with a similar skill set um, and to really gain that ability to lead to influence, which is going to be critical in, in most jobs that, that you're going to be going after. No, and the awesome. only thing I would add to that, and I absolutely, I think they've, they've spelled it out perfectly, is to think even through any volunteer experience that you've done. So anything mm -hmm. that you do, even though it's not paid, but maybe it's volunteer, I think it shows initiative uh, from that same point. And then the only other piece I would say is once you've been maybe working for five years, then you can probably take those off. Um, I'd always keep volunteer or anything that I think helps just show your initiative. But um, no, I think both of them said it well. Agreed. Okay. Um, okay, so I have a question that's actually not for you guys, but I'm going to answer it really quick. Um, somebody asked if we, if they could put the learning series on their resume. Um, I highly, highly recommend that. And actually, this, now that I'm reading it out loud, I realize that you guys could totally weigh in on this. Um, but I think just because, you know, internships were canceled, you found a really productive use of your time. Um, I would definitely recommend putting this on your resume and then, you know, just being able to explain it would also be helpful as well. So I don't know if you guys want to weigh in on that. I thought they were asking something else until I read it out loud. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Go ahead, Tom. Nope, I'm just, I agree. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think that this okay. is a unique time. I'm sorry, just going to jump in to where a lot of folks' internships did get canceled or there was, you know, just circumstances that were out of your control. So to show that you took that time, you rallied in that time, uh, and you found the best use of your situation, you know, to, to, you know, make the best of it that you could, I think that's what you can use that. And that would be a great way to answer a question that, you know, even though you were looking forward to this internship and you were excited to gain that experience and it wasn't able to happen due to, to the pandemic, that you were still able to connect with folks at Corning, you were still able to network and build those relationships, you know, and, and turn that into a valuable experience. Awesome. Um, 
Okay, so I am a rising senior in engineering, and unfortunately, I was unsuccessful in getting an internship until this summer. However, my internship, which was with a company other than Corning, was suspended due to COVID. Since I haven't had any professional engineering work experience, could this hinder my chances of being hired either for a full-time job or an internship coming out of college? Jackie, I think you're muted. Of course I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> so I think when you think about how to make yourself marketable as a candidate, um, focus on the things that are going to show where you can add value to an organization. So there's probably gonna be a lot of people in that same boat, unfortunately, that this is that first internship, they're gonna be graduating, um, the internships didn't happen. Um, see what things you can become involved in during your senior year through school. Reach out to your professors. Um, maybe during school, uh, check some company websites. Um, some organizations might have short little stints, um, maybe on break, um, so like winter break. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity to um, have a short internship with a company. I think we're going to see a lot of really different and creative things that companies are going to start to do because of these, these different times that we're in. Um, so I would just really focus on how you can broaden your experience as much as possible um, and really take advantage of those opportunities. Um, and then I think just trying to pull out as much of that content on your resume will help you. Um, will you go up against candidates that may have had other internships? Yes, probably. Um, does that necessarily hurt your chances? Not necessarily. Um, companies look for all different kinds of backgrounds, skills, experience, um, the work that you do, the projects that you work on at school, all of that's going to be relevant and that's going to help build your portfolio as a candidate. Um, so just, you know, do whatever you can and I think continuing to focus on that. Um, hopefully will help you kind of get that foot in the door that you need. I don't know how you guys think about that. Okay. So I, I then, agree. Oh, I'll probably, I'm going to go on a little bit of a, maybe a side tangent to that is, is that whether it's, you know, your, this is your senior year coming up, I just think networking, and I think Jackie kind of mm -hmm. talked about it, whether it's your professors, but you know, networking to, you know, whether it's groups, and, and I know we have a presentation coming up next week, but, and then we'll talk about LinkedIn, your social media presence, but, um, you know, anything you can do today, whether it's follow certain companies, engage in certain companies, if they talk about um, different, whether it's blogs or LinkedIn, and, and get to know who, who's at some of these companies, start targeting them today, and, and find out, you know, who, who might be good for you to connect with, just on a, a level of, hey, I want to learn more about this organization. Even though you're not ready to get a job yet, it never hurts to network today um, for that future that you might be able to go, hey, do you remember we talked last year? Um, I see you have a position open. I'd be interested in learning more. So um, if, the more you can do today, again, even at, with your professors, because a lot of professors, um, they consult on the side um, in a lot of different organizations. and so. If you can get, um, you know, they can give you information, they can help you, they can introduce you. So all of those are always helpful. Awesome. Um, I love this question. I'm really excited about it because I am a very organized meat freak. Um, but they're at, Michelle's asking, for my resume, I use invisible tables to format and keep things organized. Do you think this will get my resume thrown out by ATS resume screening? Um, the table helps keep my employment dates to the right of the page for me. I don't think so. I'm not sure why that would have an impact if you're just kind of uploading it in, in the different systems. So I don't really think that that should have an impact. I mean, of course, there's going to be a lot of there could be a data system, but for Corning, I mean, I don't think that that would cause any issue. I see all sorts of weird re resumes that get through, so I don't think that's going to um, cause you any issue. Yeah, for the most part, ATSs aren't going to screen out resumes due to formatting. Um, I think from some of the other presentations that we were on, there's a, a little bit of a misconception that ATSs are going to weed out resumes and filter out resumes. Um, 
also, I think sometimes resumes may have um, like upload um, issues, like if you're using a certain tool, um, whether or not maybe an ATS is compatible with the, the program that you're using. I think, honestly, if you want to play it safe, um, just convert your resume to a PDF. Um, but I don't think using, like Julie said, I don't think using those tables um, will will cause an issue. And best practice that we use, and I would think most companies do too, is uh, when you apply for an ATS, you're inputting information and then you're uploading your resume. So if we ever see a candidate and we can't view their resume, um, but we can see a little bit about their work history, we'll reach out and ask you to email us your resume if it's not coming through. So um, I, I do think that you would be okay there. Awesome. Um, is oh, there any advice for, yeah, um, is there any advice for students graduating in December instead of May? And then what would be the recommended job searching timeline in that case? So, so did I understand the question they're graduating in December? Correct. Instead of the typical May. So I actually think that's better. Um, and the reason I would say that is that in December or really that November, December, a lot of organizations, if they're on a January New Year start date, budgets are starting to get approved in December. So a lot of times managers are knowing about positions prior to that. So sometimes um, you, you can see an influx in January of new positions that from a budgetary perspective get approved. So um, the other piece can be typically for a lot of, um, whether it's HR, or recruiters, December can be a little bit slow because of all the holidays, so they have a little more free time. So again, um, making that connection during that time can be a plus. So, um, you know, that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, and I think you always want to start your search sooner than later. You know, you don't need to wait until you walk the stage. Um, you know, I would definitely start, you know, putting feelers out there, you know, a month or so, maybe two months even. So depending on the area that you're targeting, because sometimes the hiring process can be a bit prolonged, especially when you're targeting a larger company. Sometimes it's lightning fast, you know, and it can be a week, but a lot of times that's just not the case. And, you know, these positions from when we open them to when we, we actually start that person can easily be, you know, two, three, four months. Um, so it's not... It's not unusual for those to take a little bit of time, and um, as long as you don't foresee any issue with you actually graduating on that day, then it won't. It, it start starting sooner than later is is never a bad thing. Um, if you are in an organization like the military, reserve, or national guard, and sometimes you have to leave in week long periods, how do companies think about candidates like that? Uh, I think because they normally have like certain service requirements, so they have uh, periods of time where they have to go and, and serve. Um, is that correct, Jess, what, what the question is asking? Yeah, like, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. I honestly think companies love that military experience. Again, I just think it's, it's the experience that you gain um, and the skills and, and just the qualities that candidates bring from, um, you know, having military experience would, would outweigh any concern about, you know, a candidate needing that time. So um, companies have different policies, so sometimes it might be your vacation time, sometimes um, they might just allow for that leave, and normally you'll know uh, what that time frame is going to be in advance. Um, so I certainly would say it's something that you would talk to um, the recruiter or HR about during the interview process if you have concerns. But I, in all my years of recruiting, I've never seen that ever be an issue. And I think companies are more than willing to um, work around that schedule wise um, to, to make sure that that can all happen as it needs to. So I've, I've never seen that be a problem. I would echo that. I, I've seen that several times in HR positions, IT positions, and nobody's ever batted an eye at that. So. Awesome. Um, is it appropriate to learn about recruiters, like what they do or what their previous experience through LinkedIn is before the interview? So I, I, I think we answered this question last time. And so I'll jump in on that one. We didn't talked about it last week. And it's always good to do your research. It's good to know who you're talking to. It's good to know where they come from. That being said, it's all about presentation. You don't want to just 
come out with all this. Oh, you know, so I saw you did this. I saw you did that. You know, you don't want to come across like you were like being, you know, overly like researching the person or creepy or whatever the case might be. But should the opportunity come up to where you can make that connection to where you could ask a question, you know, then you certainly want to take that. So you want to be over prepared. You want to know who you're talking to. Um, but you, you know, want to be careful with the delivery of that information. So it's still coming off professional. Um, and so it's adding value to the conversation that you're having. Yep. That's a great way to put it is always think about what's going to add value to your conversation, your interactions as you go through an interview process. That's, that's an awesome way to think about it, Julie. And I think that's a good best practice that you all can, can kind of continue to take away and, and, and use throughout your career. It's like everything that you do is sort of a building block and what's going to continue to add value there. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, always, always do your homework and research. Yeah. So and the, the one thing I would add to that, and I, and I agree with what's been said, is, is I think that preparation process and it, it, the way I would look at any interview you have is over prepare. You're not going to use everything that you prepare and certainly you want to make it professional. But to that example, if it comes up in conversation that, you know, you have a similarity to that recruiter or hiring manager um, or even more information, you know, about the organization and the job um, is, is really good. Get on you know, glass door and just look at reviews. You don't have to necessarily bring it up, but it's knowledge for you. Even to that point, maybe think about what questions might they ask me about my background. And, and write it down and be in advance. And it's not that so you're you're kind of regurgitating it, but your mind is more prepared than to answer that question. And you can recall it quicker and feel more comfortable because interviews are stressful. And so the more comfortable you can feel because you've kind of prepared yourself, the better that, as, as Julie even said, that professional just presentation comes across better. Um, does it make a difference if you get your master's right after undergrad or do companies want to see a few years of work experience and then getting your master's? I've heard so many mixed thoughts on this. I think it depends on the job, the company, the person. I think there's so many variables that go into it. So, you know, you should really do what makes sense for you. Um, and then, you know, kind of parlay that into a career. There's no one size fits all. It, it, it's kind of what you make of it, I would say. Not very helpful, was that? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, there isn't like an exact science to it. Um, so I, I would 100% agree with what Julie said. I think if you think about what's going to make sense for you, uh, what do you hope to get out of your master's degree versus do I need to go work for a few years to see if this is really what I want to do before I invest that time in getting that master's degree? Am I going to want to get a master's degree while I'm working and do it part time? Am I going to stop working and go back and get a master's degree? Am I going to have that financial ability to do that? So maybe those are some good questions to think about. I don't think companies are necessarily going to have a preference. Um, but I think if you can think about how that's going to play a role in sort of the trajectory of your career, that may be the better thing to think about when you're deciding, because there, there is no right or wrong, just what's going to work for you. I don't think it's bad to do it right after your bachelor's. There's, there's pros and cons to, to each way, and I think that there's so many personal uh, factors that go into that um, other than just, you know, the, the job. Um, how many pages of a resume do you suggest recent graduates should have? And actually, this is a two part question, so I'm just going to ask the first part. How many pages of a resume do you suggest recent graduates should have? One. One. <laughs> One page. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, and then, what do you usually notice first in a resume? Ooh. I know, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I would say based on the audience, um, a lot of it can be your education. Um, if, yeah. For what you're going to be looking for, and you know, <laughs> if it's an entry-level job or uh, some sort of that, 
then we probably would look to you, you know, do you maybe have a high GPA that's listed or what, again, and I know we kind of talked about this, but what associations were you in or what, what did you do while you were in school? So it's, it, cause you know, it's, it is it kind of your first job. So yeah, you won't probably have a lot of experience that we'll look at. So we'll probably gravitate to that education and maybe did you do some things or did you list some specific coursework that you tailored it to this job to say, hey, I, I, I've learned this, I did have done this. And you know, that's always helpful. So one thing I would say is that sometimes it's, um, when I'm looking at a resume, right? Cause we're, we're looking at a lot of resumes. So, so it's true when they say, you know, we'll glance at it. So I, you want your resume to be visually appealing, right? You want it to be reasonably, um, you know, balanced. Do you want dates to line up? I will say it's a, it's, a, it's a huge pet peeve. And this is just me, this is my pet peeve. But if somebody has dates, you know, on the side of the page and they're like not lined up, and they're all tabbed to different sections, even if it's just by like a few spaces or or if somebody, if you put, you know, um, started doing like four, you know, 18 through, you know, five, 19, and then you switched over to writing out like April and May, you know, I think I notice either consistency or lack of consistency. And I make a lot of judgments based on that. So when you have your resume together, um, for me, you know, when I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, okay, this either looks good, the person spent some time on it, or they, or, or it hasn't, because there's there's something that's striking me as off about it, and you don't want it to strike as off. You want it to be reasonably visually appealing, with things lined up, with things clear. Um, you don't want to notice, you know, I like when there's bullets. I don't like huge paragraphs because I don't want to read three paragraphs on your resume, regardless if you have. 20 years of experience or no experience, you know, I'm looking to get a quick snapshot. So I'm looking for something that's allowing me to easily get the information um, so I can kind of look at it, make my assessment and move on. Whether that's the right answer or not, that's kind of how I'm looking at resumes when I'm flying through them. Sometimes the errors or the things that look off stand out more than when things are kind of neat and tidy and organized. And so while it probably depends on the job that you're applying for, what's going to stand out in terms of like the green check marks, this is the stuff that they're looking for, make sure your resume doesn't stand out for a negative reason. So all the things that Julie talked about, um, watch those things. Um, six seconds. So if I'm a hiring manager or a recruiter and I'm looking at your resume, that first six seconds, what's going to stand out. So pull up your resume, glance at it, have somebody else check your resume. So a friend, a family member, somebody, and just say, hey, look at this, glance at this, what stands out to you, what do you see? Um, and they might they might some, find some things that you can improve upon, but um, yeah. definitely watch that. And if you, have, if you have a cover letter, make sure that you are changing the company name or who you're sending it to. I see more errors mm -hmm. with cover letters than I see anywhere else. So if you want to do a cover letter, that's great. I'll be honest, very rarely do, am I gonna read every cover letter that's sent because that's just a lot of extra, you know, I'm looking, like Jackie said, to check different boxes when I'm looking at a resume. Um, but if you do have one and it is addressed wrong or it has the wrong company name, you know, make sure that it's personalized every time because I see that catch so many people more so than anything else. So, and just to maybe change it up to Julie's point, um, I read cover letters. And so, um, so I'm not saying everybody does need to do one because I think she's making a good point. Some, some recruiters do, some don't. What I like about the cover letter, if you have it kind of specific for each job that you apply to, it gives you a, an opportunity to share your story. Mm -hmm. and so you can share a few things. So once I get through the resume, I then go look at the cover letter to see how it pulls in things maybe that I didn't see on the resume. So um, it, if you're going to do it, do it well and be specific. But, um, you know, I, some do and some don't. So. Yeah. And I'll always send it along. If it gets to me and it's there, I'm going to pass it along. So there's a good opportunity. There's a good chance that somebody's going to read that. So you want to make sure that, again, if you're going to do it, that you're doing it right because you don't want to knock yourself out for it. 
Awesome. So a few, there's actually two questions about what a preference is on previous experience. So the, between the two questions, they're wondering, you know, is there a preference on focusing more on previous internships, lab research experience, um, or better to be involved with engineering research or a design team for experience? Like where, mm. when they're interviewing for an engineering role, what's the preference in terms of background and experience? So <laughs> these answers are all going to be, well, <laughs> so it depends on the role you're applying for, right? If you have an engineering degree and you want to work in research, the research part is going to be more relevant. Um, for Corning, I know because a lot of, for our division, um, we are hiring engineers to work in a plant, so research may not translate into a plant environment as well as an internship where you were working on a design team or working in a plant doesn't mean that you wouldn't be considered, but I think you just, and I know sometimes it's hard to think about this because when you're in school, you, you don't necessarily know exactly what job you're going to want or what you're going to do, um, but try to think about that a little bit. There's no right or wrong. Any experience is good experience. It's all what you get out of the experience that's going to be most important. But I do think that, um, think about the industry that you want to work in. Think about, um, you know, what, what types of jobs you think you would be interested in. What are your strengths and where do you think those strengths would be? Also, part of an internship is, is learning just that. What do I want to do? Is this for me um, or is this not for me? Do I want to work in a manufacturing plant environment? Do I want to sit behind a desk? Do I want to work in research? And so don't. Um, don't worry too much um, about, oh, well, I had research experience, but I, I want to work in a plant. Try to get that experience. Um, or think about what are some of the other things that you can do in school to help you prepare for a job like that. Um, so it, it does just kind of depend, but I, I don't just think there's a right or wrong. Um, but if you want to work in a, in a manufacturing environment and you only go after research internships, just it may not may not really be helping you on the right career path. If you're truly not sure, then then trial avenues and um, you know get a broad range of experience. I would say. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Um, it is okay. So hold on one second because I'd ask a question. Okay, would it be appropriate to bring up to recruiters this fall that I am planning on taking the fundamentals of engineering exam in December? Or should I wait until after I take the exam and pass it to put it on my resume? I'm not super familiar with the exam, um, being that I don't have a ton of hiring managers look for that. Uh, not that it's not relevant and important, um, but I would say if you're going to take any type of exam, maybe Julie, you can land on this from finance. Like if you're going to take or you're going to sit for, you know, your CSA or your CPA, you can put anticipated date that you're going to take the exam. Uh, you can put it on the resume just to show that you are worth it um, and then update your resume once you actually take the exam, but don't put CPA on your resume or don't put the engineering exam on your resume and not show that you haven't taken that because then it almost looks like you're saying you have it. You have your CPA designation before you actually might have it. Um, so just be careful, and that goes for the engineering exam, that goes for anything. If you are working towards a certification that's specific to your industry, but you don't have it yet, just make sure you notate that so it, it's not misleading. I don't know, Julie, if that's Yeah, accurate. I would agree. <laughs> or right. yeah, I see that with CPAs um, all the time, you know, because it's a process. So anything like that, that's a process. It's good to know that you're working towards it. It's good to know your timeline. Um, but once you put it in writing, you know, you want to stick to that timeline. So make sure that it's realistic for you and it's realistic for whatever it is that you're going after. Awesome. Um, I, am real, I really like this question. <laughs> so for emails, should you base your reply on how formal the recruiter's email is? So say they start the email with, hi, Michelle, and sign off with just their first name. Yeah, I, I would resp respond appropriately. I don't see anything wrong with that. 
just make sure that you use the person's right name because there's many times that people called me the wrong name. We brought this up in the last call. I don't think my name's that difficult, so I'm not sure why I'm always called the wrong name, but make sure you double check. If the person's name is Julie, put Julie, don't put Julia. You know, make sure you spell it right. I think those things are gonna be more important um, than anything else. The attention to detail. Just a quick note on that too, is pay attention to the email formatting to make sure you're getting their first name and not their last name. <laughs> ah, that's true. <laughs> E, has that happened to you? <laughs> Once or twice. <laughs> so I think even in that vein, it's it's important to, um, I'd always say, and you can even put this into on your interview, how how you dress. If they say their work has their work casual, I think I'd still go up a notch mm -hmm. to be a little overdressed. You don't have to put a, maybe a tie on, but a jacket or a professional suit. Or, or shirt. So I think from a name perspective, a lot of times uh, recruiters or whoever's reaching out to you may have a kind of a more of a signature. Um, but I would still use then, if that's the case, and I'll use Julie, if maybe she signs off as Jules. Now I wouldn't say that as in hi Jules, I would say hi Julie, because you know that's her real, her official name, so to speak. Awesome. Um, do you suggest recent graduates include a summary statement in the resume? If, you, if yes, do you suggest we include soft skills like excellent communication skills in the summary statement? I mean, I think it depends. So here, I think it goes back to your one page resume. You don't want it to start going into a second page, you know, do you have a cover letter? Do you not? You know, you want to make sure that whatever you're having on there is valuable. It's valuable and you can back it up. Um, so, you know, if you have those soft skills on there, that's fine and good. Nobody's going to be like, oh, I have terrible communication, right? So, like, we're hoping that you have good communication. The so soft skills are good, but you want to be able to speak to those. You want to make sure that, you know, it's, it's only one page. So that's, you know, really valuable space. And you want to make sure that whatever you're putting on there is really adding value as far as giving person looking at it, information that they want. So, and I would absolutely agree with that. If it's, and we talk about even customizing the cover letter, it's okay to customize that kind of career summary because you may apply to different roles that have different things they're looking for. The only thing I would say is if, it, if it's too generic in the sense of I'm a strong communicator who's assertive and, and using all those action words, um, it doesn't really say much because you're right. I think there are certain assumptions we're going to expect that you're able to communicate and that you're able to write or those things. So maybe think about what you want to say, tailor it to more of what you are and about what you're applying to. Awesome. Um, if I'm looking to be in research and development, is it better to go to graduate school right away after college since a lot of job listings do require a master's degree? That's a really good question. And I think the way that you're thinking about it is, is the right way. So if you know that there are types of jobs that you've seen out there that look really interesting to you, you're really wanting to go down that path, but you are seeing that they require a master's degree, maybe maybe that's then helping you make that decision if, if that's the right career path for you. Um, so, yeah, um, I, again, I don't think it's required, but if the type of work you want to do, and when you look at those job descriptions, if you're always seeing master's degree come up, then yeah, maybe that is, is sort of signaling to you that that's a good path to take. And that's a really smart thing to do is, hey, this is maybe the type of job I want after college. I'm going to start looking at those job descriptions now. What are they looking for? What am I missing? What can I do to make sure that I tick all those boxes when I go to apply for that job? Um, so it's actually a really, I think, smart thing to do now um, and, and will help guide you as you work towards applying for those types of jobs. And if any of you guys were on the engineering session earlier today, the answer to that question is absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you should just answer that one then. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, okay. So how is the recent immigration ban going to affect hiring of international students at Corning? Uh, good question. Um, probably a lot of it we still don't know. Um, I would say not just for Corning, but for most companies, when you look at a job description um, on their page, it will specify whether or not they can support visa sponsorship. And the best thing to do is, is just look at that information and see if that's a viable option for that role, that company at that time. Um, and, and really a lot of it's just going to evolve over time. Things, as I'm sure you all know, have been changing weekly, if not daily, um, around this hot topic. So um, just, just be sensitive to the information that the company is listing. Um, be transparent in, in the information that you're providing as, as companies will do the same. And, um, that's, that's probably the best way to approach something like that right now. It will depend. That's a good question. And then um, I know that we had kind of touched upon this last week, but maybe just kind of going over it again. How many days after the interview or first contact is it okay to follow up? So we, we did talk about this last week and it really depends where in the process you are. Um, and I think that's for, something to really think about. You know, have you had an initial phone screen with the recruiter? Have you talked to the hiring manager? Have you had an on-site interview? Um, you know, you don't really want to check in more than once a week. If you've, if you've applied and you haven't heard back, you know, maybe one check-in. If you've had an initial phone screen with the recruiter, I think it's okay at the end of that conversation to talk about what their timeline is. Um, and then follow up with them, you know, in line with whatever their timeline may be. That way everybody's on the same page. And I think that goes the same for a lot of on-site interviews, you know, wrapping things up and understanding, you know, when they're hoping to get somebody onboarded for this position um, and using that, you know, to guide you um, in your connection process with the team, the recruiter, whoever it may be. But it never hurts to, to check in. And, and I mentioned last week, you know, it's all about your tone when you're sending these notes, you know, make sure you're being kind, make sure you're being thoughtful. And, and it's the undertone of it is, you know, I'm excited about this job. I hope I'm still being considered. If there's any other information I can provide, you know, let me know. I look forward to hearing back one way or another. Um, not, you know, it's been two weeks. Um, I'm, you know, wondering what's happening. It's, it's about tone, it's about presentation um, and, and, you know, coming about it with the right attitude. Um, okay, so then this is a good one about LinkedIn. So how is it okay to approach a recruiter on LinkedIn? If so, how do I ask them about the positions I'm interested in? As the recruiters are very busy, should one establish a relationship for a few days and ask about any position or just ask right away? Okay. I get um, I think you're on. Oh, go ahead, Jackie. Oh, I think I was telling Tom you was on. Oh, okay, Tom. 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 I was. Okay. <laughs> yep. All right. So it's a great question. I, I, I suppose we should start off as all of us that are in town acquisition apologize that we don't reply to every in mail we get. We just we don't. And it's you know we often in the corporate world call that candidate experience, and we we want every candidate to have a great experience, but unfortunately, just the amount of time in a day, it happens. Um, some recruiters do a better job than others, but some don't. So um, from that perspective, I like the approach of if you're networking and you've created a relationship in advance, it, it's helpful. Um, I, I guess the other is don't take it personal if you don't get a response. It's it's. It's unfortunately, it, it happened. So it's not that they didn't like what you said, but it's that they're not responding. And one other thing to add, we talked about this a little bit last week. So, and I know it's not always possible to tell, right? Oh, she froze. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Oh, she'll be back. Yeah, I, oh, there she is. Oh, there you are. Oh, sorry, Austin. guys. Can you hear, can you see me? Can you hear me? Austin. Yes, no, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Julie, 
we missed we missed all of that so if you could start over and okay repeat, that would be great that's asking him a lot for me to like reprocess this but i'll try so Corning's talent acquisition team is, is quite substantial, right? And, and it's not always possible to know who you're reaching out to and you're just trying to make a, a connection at a company. But for instance, myself, if you look at my LinkedIn, LinkedIn profile, um, it talks about the areas that I support, which is not engineering. I support um, technology, human resources, legal, and the past I've also handled finance, GSM, you know, all corporate staff services. And I get so many messages about these really specific engineers. And that's just not something that I deal with. So I certainly try to pass those over to the right folks. And there's no way you're always going to like 100% get the right person, but definitely try to target the right person within the organization. You know, I do always try to get back to those because those are connections that I can um, pass along to the group. But when I get all these engineering, you know, that's not my, my specialty. So you cut out a little bit. Oh, um, sorry, guys. Uh, but it was just towards the end, and I think you were just kind of summing up where you should really just look at who you're reaching out to right. when you're reaching out to recruiters on LinkedIn. So, darn internet. Good thing this isn't an interview. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, and then let me pull up these questions that we had. Okay, so for former interns who had their internships cancel, internship canceled this summer, what kind of networking could we do to reach out to either a different location or a company from where we previously interned? So they have the internship canceled. And they're trying to network with, well, if, it's, if you're trying to network with a company where you had a past intern, the hope would be is that when you left that internship, you left with some good contacts and, and network connections that you can reach out to for career advice or, again, networking opportunities. Um, and that's a really good point and thing to think about when you have an internship. Make sure you're building good relationships. Make sure you're leaving on a really positive note so that you have some of those connections. Those are, those are industry experts and, and people that are working for that company that um, will speak on your behalf. I mean, there's a lot of times where, you know, in, in passing a manager will say, you know, I had this great intern. They were wonderful. Um, they left an impression on them and, and they might even, you know, think of you hopefully for a future role on their team. So, uh, yes, always be thinking about those opportunities to build those connections. Um, think about the impact that you are making and the impression that you're leaving when you leave a company. Um, I don't know if that completely directly answers that question, um, but hopefully that, yeah, I mean, it, it's very, very important to, to continue those connections post internship. Was that the whole question, Jeff, or did I miss part of it? No, that was it. That was good. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, what are some ways to make your application stand out? Hmm. You probably all could say something different. Um, I think it, again, probably depends on the job, what you're applying for. Um, think about what's most important, what you see on that job description. Um, make sure that your resume highlights the experience that they're looking for. So if you're applying for a particular engineering job and they're looking for specific experience, um, if you have that experience, make sure you can see it on your resume. If you don't have the experience, don't put something on there that isn't completely true. Um, don't build that fluff into your resume because um, that'll get flushed out in, a, in an interview anyway when they ask you about it. Um, but, you know, it's in our resume review presentation, we did talk about that. You know, it's good to make sure that the skills that, you, that they're looking for in a job description are visible on your resume if you have that experience. And I think that's going to stand out. You know, when a recruiter is reviewing your resume, they're checking those boxes. Do they have A, B, and C? And if they're seeing that, that's a good indication that you're a good fit for the job. That's what I'd say. 
And the only thing I might say to that um, would be, and I know everybody's always looking for that way to stand out, because you're right, there's a lot of a competition for roles that you're going to be interested in. So, it, and I would say some people go on the extreme creative side to maybe make their resume stick out. Is it a risk? Yes. Does it always work? I think probably not, because we look at that and we go, wow, that's just too much, it's too bright. I've seen ones where they make the resume yellow or orange, so we can't miss it. Um, and so try to find ways maybe that help your personality come out of it, but not taking too much of a risk. I like that people take risks, but sometimes it can backfire a little bit. So I'm not saying don't ever take a big risk, but I'd probably be more conservative on the risk and highlight kind of what Jackie said and in your experience that are tailored to that, but. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so this is actually good, so you, all of you could probably answer this, but how do recruiters differentiate between candidates with very similar backgrounds? We talked to you. Yeah. <clears throat> we are on the side of reaching out. I mean, if you have the background that we're looking for, if you have the skills, you have an in-demand skill set, we're going to reach out to you because even if we only have one position, you know, it could be an opportunistic hire. It could be somebody that we want to keep in mind for a pipeline candidate. Um, so, you know, if you have, you know, the degree, the experience, you know, we're, we're going to reach out, we're going to talk to you, we're going to learn more because you know, we need to see what's past that resume. You know, how, how do you communicate on the phone? How do you answer questions? Um, so we're gonna err on the side of reaching out. 100%. Be ready for our phone call. <laughs> <laughs> um, any tips for that initial kind of phone call? Like, you know, how to be ready to answer the phone professionally, or like, what do you do if you're not able to talk? Is it better to go to voicemail or to answer and say that you're not available? So we usually will email you to set up a time because we want you at your best. You know, we don't want to catch you at a time where you can't talk. Um, you know, every once in a while, usually if I've already established a rapport with somebody and if I need a quick answer, I may call them and say, hey, you know, I know you're at work. So I know you may not be able to talk, but I just needed you to answer ABC um, and say, okay, you know, let's connect later. But if it's somebody that we're trying to have that initial conversation with, we'll send an email out. So to that point, make sure whatever email you put on your resume is professional. Make sure that you check it. Make sure there's no typos because we're probably going to email you first. We may email you twice, but then after that, we're like, all right, they're not interested. Um, I don't so much anymore see any like weird emails, but there definitely was a time in my recruiting days where I would be like, hmm, is that really the best email to put on your resume? And I think you can all use your imaginations for something weird that, you know, you may have had as an email um, at one point in your life. Um, so, you know, something to think about. But again, check your email. I can't tell you how many times people don't respond to the email when they're job searching or they say, oh, you know, I, I made a special email for my job search and I just didn't check it. And you're like, okay, well. That doesn't make much sense now, does it? Um, so, you know, be aware of those things, check your email and, and get back to somebody quickly. I mean, I love it when people get back to me quickly, we can get something coordinated and then, you know, be prepared to take that phone call somewhere quiet where you can focus. And then, um, you know, if you were on the call last week, you know, you want to make sure you, you go through all the prep for that. But um, that's my, my response. Yeah, that's a great point. You're actively searching for a job. So I'd say in the event that you do get a call versus an email, um, just answer your phone professionally every time. We all have caller ID, so we'll know if it's our parents calling us <laughs> or not. And I think just be aware of that. Um, and then make sure your voicemail is free and clear so that we can leave you a voicemail if possible. Because yeah. um, it's definitely happened many, many times where um, I call somebody and their voicemail box is full. And that's okay, we can email you. Um, but um, make, sure it's, make sure it's free and clear. Make sure that we can get in contact with you as many ways as possible. And then like Julie said, you know, respond quickly. If you can't pick up the phone, that's okay. Let it go to voicemail. 
um, go answer it when you do have a little bit of quiet time where you can have a quick conversation. Um, but most recruiters, even outside of Corning, at Corning, we normally will email you first. But other companies, they may call you, um, and, and that's okay. It can go to voicemail if you're busy. Um, but assume that when you are answering the phone, that it could be a recruiter or it could be somebody calling you about a job and just answer professionally and um, sound, uh, sound excited. Don't sound annoyed when you answer the phone. That's happened a lot too where um, they, they sound very annoyed and bothered um, that somebody's calling them. Um, so if, if you're busy, then just we'll leave a message. You can call back. So to follow up with that though, let's say the recruiter calls you, you don't answer because you are in a place where you can't answer and they leave a voicemail and then you're going to call them back. I find it helpful, and I do this in my job. A lot of times I'm what I call, I may be cold calling a candidate to um, try to, to the, get to them. So I plan that I may have to leave a voicemail. So do the same kind of practice that, you know, let's say you're calling Jackie back, you can say, practice, hi Jackie, this is Tom. I got your voicemail. Um, I was unavailable at the time. Uh, I am available now, or if you'd like, we can schedule time. I'm free between four and six. And so you've kind of thought about what you might want to say in case it goes to Jackie's voicemail so that you've given her maybe some guidance about what to do as opposed to go, oh, Jackie, um, this is Tom. I didn't get your call. Uh, call me back. And so it doesn't, so practice it. It helps. And we know everybody is super eager. Um, it's an exciting time. I, I probably feel the same as everybody else on the call. We, we love helping people get jobs. But if a recruiter calls you and you call them back and they, it goes to voicemail and they don't answer, um, don't call them five times in a row. I promise somebody will call you back. Um, they're probably on another line. They're probably, um, you know, just, just not available to get the call. Um, so the, the eagerness is awesome. Um, and we love the enthusiasm. And we called you. We reached out to you. We really want to talk to you. Um, but call, leave a message, and then give them some time to get back to you. If you don't hear um, by the end of the day, call again first thing in the morning. But give them a little bit of time to, to circle back. Well, and, and just a good point to that as well is just seeing how we structure our day sometimes, we may block out a couple of hours that we make calls. We may then block out time that we do interviews. And then we may block out time that we're doing emails so that we don't answer calls so that we can get through other processes in our day. So to, to Jackie's point, if, if we don't call you back right away, it's not because, again, we're not interested, that we just may have structured our day so that it's at the end of the day or first thing in the morning. Um, how can you make sure or what's the best way to be considered for an internship or job if some skills are missing from the job description, especially on the technical aspects where maybe only a person from your field would be able to gauge your resume? So I would say, you know, even though we may not all be, so I recruit for IT, right, but I'm not going to sit here and code anything per se, right? Um, but I certainly know what keywords I'm looking for. So we are the first line of defense on those resumes. Um, so you, your, your resume is a reflection of you. So you wanna put down what you've done. Um, and a lot of times, you know, we've been recruiting in these fields for a long time and we know what skills are comparable to other skills. So you wanna make sure that your resume is filled with a lot of the things that, that, um, that you've done. So even if the job description is a little bit vague, um, that you're covering your bases as, as looking like a strong candidate. Yep, 100%. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we actually, oh, go ahead. E. I was going to say, this is, this is a quick note on that last question. Something else that I think is worth mentioning is that, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, you want to work with a recruiter who's familiar with your space, and, and sometimes you're working with recruiters who might have more of a general knowledge. It's worth investing the time in having a conversation with that recruiter and educating them on your skills and how they apply to that role so that they can advocate on your behalf because, again, the, the recruiters are the gatekeepers, but if you arm them with the knowledge, that they can then use to advocate on your behalf, it'll increase your odds of getting in front of those hiring managers. 
It's a good point. Um, okay, how do you handle the quiet, shy candidate who has an amazing resume and experience but doesn't sell themselves well over the phone? Prep them. <laughs> Encourage them to practice. Um, you know, it depends, right? So if you're coming in for one of my HR jobs, you know, you're gonna, we're gonna want somebody who's going to be um, more strong with their communication, right? But I certainly know many groups within Corning that that is not expected. I know there's some groups within corporate staff that that's just not expected. So if that's not your personality, um, you know, to a certain extent, then that's okay. Um, but you do wanna make sure that you are prepared to answer questions, to discuss your background and, and to be yourself. You know, you, you are who you are and, and that's great. And there's many groups of people that just, you know, sit at their desk and code all day. And, and that's what we need from them. And we don't expect them to come into the interview, you know, super bubbly and excited and whatever, you know, they're coming in to talk about their skills and that's okay. So I think it's important to know who you are, what the job is that you're interviewing for and have some realistic expectations. You know, if you're interviewing for a job that requires you to be a little bit more bubbly and excited, you know, maybe that's something that you work on. Maybe that's that's something that you acknowledge as something that you're working towards. Um, but I think it's being aware of your strengths and your weaknesses, working on those. And like Tom has said, like Jackie said, like you probably heard from us over and over, practice makes perfect. The age old expression, fake it till you make it, um, you know, do your best, always, always practice. Don't be afraid to um, ask the recruiter that you're working with before you interview with the team if they have any, I mean, usually the recruiters will give you some good tips and pointers, but ask them. Um, they might even be willing to like, you know, prep you, go through a couple of practice questions, um, use those recruiting teams to help you. That's, that's one of the big things that I love about our team here at Corning is that we really build good relationships with the candidates that we're working with through an interview process, um, and we want you to succeed. Um, so we'll give you lots of good prep material. Um, use it, read it. If a recruiter sends you prep information from a, another company, look through it. It's gonna be helpful, um, and like Julie said, practice. Um, you don't need to be the loudest, most bubbly person in the world to do well on an interview. If you can articulate your experience, have good eye contact, um, make a good impression, um, and really talk about your experience in a good, meaningful way, you'll do just fine. So practice. Um, thank you. Is one or two bullet points enough for a job description, or should I elaborate more? Or are you saying on your resume to describe the work that you've done? Yes, yes. yes I think sorry. It, it depends, you know, um, so if you're coming right out of school and you're talking about a project per se that you worked on, that may be enough. Um, if you're working at a job, you know, out of school and you've been there for a couple of years, I would say that that's probably not enough. You know, they want to see what you've done and what you've accomplished there. So I think it's very situational depending on the length of time you spent doing something, what you accomplished. Um, so I think it, it can certainly vary, but if you've been somewhere for a length of time. Uh, oh, okay, we lost Julie. <laughs> oh, gosh, sorry. Oh, there she is. Sorry. Oh. I don't know what's going on with my so, internet. The last thing we heard was if you've been there for a length of time. <laughs> oh yeah, if you've been there for a length of time, we would hope that you would have, you know, many things to discuss about your time. There are many skills that you developed while you were there. However, if it was just a short stint, if it was inter an internship or a project, you know, it may only be one or two bullet points. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we can make this the last call for questions, but didn't know if each of you had like, What's your like one piece of advice that you could give to a candidate? What do you think that it would be? Jackie, do you want to start? Yeah, I'm thinking about that one piece of advice. I have so much advice. <laughs> <laughs> I I do think um, that 
once you have your resume, once you've applied and you've got your foot in the door, just know how critical it is when you get that face time with the, the hiring team. Um, especially, I think for our audience on the call, um, you know, this is probably the first interview. These are the first interviews of your career. So we know that you're not going to have interviewed a ton, but I think that any amount of preparing and researching the company and thinking about how you are going to explain your experience um, in a meaningful way that's going to show how you can do this job. I mean, that is, that's your golden ticket, right? That's, that's, that's the super, super critical piece. So um, you can, and that's the piece really that you are kind of flying solo. You know, you can get resume help and you can network and you can figure out how to get your in into that company, um, but don't lose sight of that interview and how important that interview is um, and all those little pieces that go into a successful interview. Um, so I just, I, I would say just keep that in your line of sight um, because a resume can look great, but sometimes we have candidates fall flat in an interview. Um, and sometimes I think it's preparedness. Um, and I just think as, as much research as you can do on the company um, about the job, you know, just, just prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, and, and really do that for every job that you interview for. Um, and I think you'll do great. I, I second what Jackie said, prepare, prepare, practice, you know, walk into that interview ready to be your best self. And the only way you can do that is by practicing, um, being prepared and letting your personality shine through. Um, whatever that means for you. You know, you want to be your best self. You want to make that personal connection. Um, and that's probably the best advice that, that I could give because, you know, you want to work with people that you like. Um, you want to work with people who are good at what they do and how you go into that interview really shows how you're going to go into your career. So be your best self, be prepared, um, and, and just let, let your personality shine through. So I think we're probably going to have a consistent message um, with what we're saying. It, it, and I agree with absolutely what both said. Um, I think the more prepared that you are. So I'm going to give you two questions that you can ask. So grab a pen. And so the first one can be at the beginning of an interview, whether it's with an HR person, a recruiter, is to ask, what does a successful person in this job look like? Their answer is going to give you the answers to the test. So that'll help you highlight things in your background, things in your experience that they're going to look for. And so that way you can prepare those things and be ready to make sure you've kind of checked those boxes. I told them I've done this. I've talked about this. Uh, the last one is at the end of the interview, whether again it's the recruiter or the, the hiring team, is to ask, hey, this has been a great discussion. Is there anything in my background that we've talked about that causes you concern? because they may go, well, you know, we're looking for somebody that's done this. Well, maybe it didn't come up, but you've had exposure to that. And so it gives you an opportunity to what I'll call rebuttal and say, well, that's a great point, but what I have done is this, and it's, it's very close to that. So I think, you know, those things kind of work well. And I think the last thing I'll say is, and studies have shown, not the most qualified always gets the job. It's the one that interviews the best. And so that's typically what can happen. So you, so don't, so by being prepared, you're more comfortable and confident. And then I know I said it was the last, I got one more. So the other is, is, is I've just seen it and, and I'm curious to have Julie and Jackie weigh in on this point, but I always have candidates follow up with me and go, hey, I wanna hear from you after, tell me how you think it went. And inevitably the candidates that I have that go, man, I just, I feel like I did really well. I knocked it out of the park. And then I talked to the hiring manager, like they didn't do very good. And then the ones that go, I'm not sure, you know, I think I answered all the questions, but I'm not sure. The hiring manager typically tells me they were a great interview. So I, I, I don't know the balance to that and why that is, but it is. So, um, but I still think the more you can prepare, the better. But Julie, Jackie, do you get that same feedback to people that say they knocked it out of the park? 
I get worried when they tell me that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think um, confidence is good. Uh, being a little cocky, not humble, sometimes does not translate well in an interview. Most oftentimes not. So while confidence is good, and I think if you feel like it was a good interview, sometimes you can get that read and you feel really energized. Um, yeah, sometimes you feel like it went great because the team is really nice and supportive and encouraging, but maybe it just didn't go so well. Um, yes, that can happen. Um, I will share this with you all because it, it's just a really good testament to why preparing is so powerful. So um, there was a time where we had a job and we had a slightly more junior candidate interview for that job. Um, but that candidate did their homework on Corning. That candidate had good questions prepared for the interview panel. Um, clearly they were engaged in the interview because they asked one question. And then as the interview progressed, they followed up on that question and tied in information that the team was sharing with them. So the team could tell that they were really listening to what they were talking about in terms of the job. Uh, they went on a plant tour and they weren't just walking around and saying, oh, wow, this is cool. They were asking questions and they could tell that that candidate was really engaged um, and they got the job. And this individual, you could just tell, really took the time to prepare for this interview. They wanted the job. They wanted to work for Corning. Um, and they really showed that to the team. They were humble, um, they were kind, they were thoughtful. This was not somebody that walked in there and acted like they knew everything. Um, they did not make up answers to questions that they didn't know. Um, and so I just think that's a really good example of what Tom said, what Julie said, prepare. Um, and really think about that impression that you're going to make uh, uh, on your team. So, yeah, it's happened sometimes, back to Tom's question, that it, it definitely has happened um, where it's, it's kind of the reverse. Um, but sometimes that, that humbleness plays a part in that. Um, so sometimes uh, you think it went well, but you're not quite sure, but it, it, I think deep down you'll know if it went well. <laughs> awesome. Well, Thank you so much, um, Jackie, Julie, and Tom for your time. This is so great. I love having you guys on. Um, I know the students really appreciate it. I always get such great feedback from our talent acquisition workshop. So um, just can't thank you enough for your answers, the time, and just the thoughtfulness in your responses. Um, for the students who attended, thank you for engaging. I love all of the questions that we asked and um, Yep, we're getting a ton of awesome thank yous for the great advice and insights. So um, thank you everybody for your time. And then thank you again for our presenters. We really appreciate it. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Thanks, guys. Hi, Bye. thank you. Bye.